Trisha, are you ready to talk about the advancements in type 2 diabetes? Well, yeah, Steve, but why are you talking like that? And I can't see anything out of these glasses. I can't either. Hey, Eric, can you help take clear this up? Oh, this is so much better. It sure is. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Dr. Trisha Santos, Steve Edelman. Today, we're going to talk about revolutionary treatments for type 2 diabetes, and there are many. There are so many. And I think, you know, the point we wanted to make at the very beginning is we have come such a long way with our treatments for type 2 diabetes. I mean, it used to be all we had were sulfonylureas and some of the old school insulins. And now we have medications that can actually not only help our diabetes, but give us a lot of other benefits. You know, the future of diabetes treatments is now. It really is. I mean, there's never been a better time to have diabetes. All right, so we're gonna jump right in. And the first point we wanna make, I think may be one of the most important. And that is that two of our newest classes to treat type two diabetes, the GLP-1s and the SGLT-2s, for those of you that are, have been around TCOID, we are talking about these all the time. And the reason is this, they help protect your heart and your kidneys. And this is probably the most important point. They do it even if your A1C is already at goal. Yeah, and the American Diabetes Association that puts out instructions on how to treat pa patients to doctors, they tell them exactly this, that if your patients have heart disease and kidney disease, it doesn't matter what the A1C is, they still help. And that's so important. Two of the most important classes of medication. Now you said new. <laughs> GLP-1 since 2005 and SGLT-2s at least six, seven years now. That's true. I should have said newer. So there are newer medications, but they've been around forever now. So let's dive in a little deeper. First, we'll talk about the SGLT-2 inhibitors. So these are medications kind of in the, in the short way to say it is they make you pee out your glucose. They make you pee out sugar. So they help your kidney put a bunch of sugar into your bladder and out into your urine. Um, you can see this picture here with all these sugar cubes in the hand. That's the amount of sugar you're peeing out every day. On average. <laughs> on these type of medications. So you can see that's a lot of sugar to be getting rid of. Yeah. In the, in the very beginning, it, you know, when we treated patients, we tested the urine for sugar and that was bad. But this is what we do on purpose. So you're getting rid of sugar which means you're getting rid of calories, which means your blood sugars are dropping. So your A1C comes down and people lose a little bit of weight. Now, I'll just warn you, if you pee on the floor in your bathroom by accident, it'll attract ants. <laughs> good it's good really advice. A, thank you. Good advice. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's look at some details with the SGLT2 inhibitors. We've kind of already said this, but they help out your diabetes. They lower that A1C. They do cause weight loss because you're basically peeing out your calories. You pee water with the sugar as well, so that helps lower your blood pressure a little bit. These are great because all by themselves, they don't cause low blood sugars. Um, so they're very safe medication in that regard. Uh, they protect your heart. Now, when we're talking about protecting your heart, we're really talking especially about patients with heart failure. And there's two types of heart failure. These medications protect both types of heart failure. Yeah, this is really important because when we say it reduces heart disease for, we're gonna to get to the little bit of differences with the GLP-1s, but I can tell you that listening to my cardiology colleagues that heart failure is the single most common cardiac abnormality in people with type two. Once you've had one episode of congestive heart failure, it it, how should I say this? It worsens your prognosis. It gives you a higher chance of having another episode and another, and um, you know, the ending could may not be good. And I have to tell you, you know, I work in the hospital and I see a lot of the heart failure patients in the hospital and the heart doctors are so excited about these medications. They are starting them left and right in the hospital because they are that good. Yeah, and you know, when they did the studies looking at the fake pill placebo versus one of these SGLT2s, uh, they're all listed on the top. Um, they saw the the reduction in heart failure within weeks mm -hmm. of the of the placebo group. So it works pretty fast too. Yeah, it also this class of medications protects your kidneys, and we're not talking about a little bit. We're talking about really life changing um, effects on the kidneys in terms of protecting your kidneys and kind of slowing down the progression of diabetic kidney disease. Yeah, if you have if you have kidney disease, you may not be able to get rid of it completely. 
but slowing it down is of tremendous value. You know, you're familiar with the EGFR in your chem panel, the creatinine. Your doctor may talk about the amount of protein in your urine. It's been shown to slow it down and reduce the need for dialysis or transplantation. Yeah. It's amazing. So you want to talk about the side effects? Yeah, you know, I, what I'd like to say is these medicines in general, they're very well tolerated. So most people don't have side effects. When you do start putting sugar into the bladder and the genital urinary area, you can get more genital infections, genital yeast infections, um, less commonly urinary tract infections. These are not super common, but they do happen. Um, and then there's a more dangerous side effect, but it's very, very, very rare, especially rare in patients with type 2 diabetes. And that's called euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a big wow. mouthful medical term. You're a doctor. <laughs> um, for, you know, when patients can get kind of very sick um, from not having enough insulin around in their body. But again, very, very low risk with type yeah. 2. And if you're prescribed this drug, it's very easy to learn about it. We have a lectures on our website. So, and, and you can also remember, you know, the weight loss is not as much as the GLP ones, but it is certainly nice. So these drugs are once a day. Uh, you take it in the morning and the, the, the yeast infections is primarily in women. Mm -hmm. And if you're a guy that's not circumcised, then your risk may be a little higher too. Okay. Let's talk about the GLP-1 receptor agonist. I'm not even going to tell you what that stands for because it's a big, long, complicated word. But this is a, a slide that I want to spend just a second on to show you how they work. First of all, the GLP-1 are secreted when you eat a meal. And then what happens is, whoops, what happens is it goes down uh, and it helps promote insulin secretion, which is good. It suppresses glucagon uh, secretion, which is very good because glucagon will raise your blood sugar and it's found to be abnormally high in type 2 diabetes, then it's going to slow down the peristaltic motion of your stomach. Now, why is that good? Well, the, when you eat food, it gets absorbed, it gets broken down in your stomach, but does not contribute to high blood sugar. It's only when the stomach propels it into the rest of the small intestine where it's absorbed and then your post-meal blood sugar goes through the roof. So if you can slow that process down, it improves your post-meal blood sugar. And then lastly, on the upper right there, it induces satiety. What is that? It's the feeling of being full. And you don't need to take a class and look here, talk to a clinical psychologist about stop eating when you're full. It just works. And people lose weight. And some people lose significant amount of weight. And we're gonna talk about the higher dose uh, GLP-1s in a second. So these are the four uh, there's many on the market. You know, we have the older by Durian, then the most recently Trulicity, Ozembic, um, and these are all once weekly. The older by Ada, Victoza once a day, Adlexin you probably never heard of. And it's important to point out Rebelsis, which is a oral GLP-1 that you take once a day. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, all of them besides Rebelsis are injections, but people need to remember these are not insulin. So a lot of people get confused about that. And I think sometimes people get scared about injections. But the thing I like about this is it's literally just the same hormone that our body makes. Yeah. You know, so it's a very safe medication. Yeah. GLP-1 mimics a natural hormone that's low in people with type 2 diabetes. And these these once weekly pens on the left, they're easy to use. Very. And uh, trust us, after you do the first one, you're going to say, is that all it was? I mean, it's it's an impressive class of agents. So this this laundry list of benefits may look similar to the GLP-1s. So very big drops in A1C, um, more significant drops in the weight, uh, and we have no issues with hypoglycemia because both the SGLT2s and this class, GLP-1s, they do not stimulate the pancreas to secrete insulin uh, in a way that we see with taking insulin or the sulfonylureas. They do it in a natural physiologic way, especially the GLP-1s. And um, it's also been shown to reduce heart disease, more specifically heart attacks and strokes. Anything to add to that? No. I just think, you know, just to hit home the point that the SGLT2s are better for heart failure. These are better for heart attacks, which is kind of when, you know, you have clogged arteries and that type of heart disease, which yep. is a little bit different. Yeah. And you know what? 
these, these two classes of medications are commonly used together. Okay, just a quick word about the high dose. Uh, and you can see that Trulicity started off at 0.75 and 1.5. Now you can go up to 3 and 4.5 milligrams. And same with Ozembic, 0 0.25, 0.5, 1.0. And then recently the 2.0 was approved. And then there's a special form of Ozembic. It's super high dose, well, 2.4. And they call that drug a different name, even though it's exactly the same. And you get with these higher dose GLP-1 side effects are the same. You do have to titrate slowly mm -hmm. uh, to make sure you don't have any nausea, which is the main side effect. Uh, greater A1C reduction, greater weight loss. Yeah, and you know, the one thing I'll say about this, the reason there are so many doses is because if you start at a low dose, which is what we do, the chances of getting the side effects are much lower. And your body, once your body kind of gets used to these medicines, the side effects really don't become an issue anymore. Yeah, and one trick that we use in clinic is that you don't have to stick to these standard levels. For example, with Ozembic, um, some patients are very sensitive to these drugs. And there's like 20 clicks between zero and 0.25. So you click, you go up 10 clicks. You do it weekly until there's no side effects. And then you can, you can go up as slow as you want. Slow titration is key. And the one thing I do want to say about Wegovi, which is the high-dose Ozempic, and this is really has been life-changing for us in the diabetes world. Wegovi, there's data out about Wegovi that it is causing weight loss similar to bariatric surgery. I mean, can you imagine that is not having to go under the knife and getting the same you know effects on weight loss? It's just really incredible. Yeah, and uh, a friend of mine's, wife is on it and she discovered a Facebook for people on uh, high dose Ozembic and Wegovi and it, they support each other in learning how to use this drug. And my, I know this, this is not that unusual, but she's lost over 40 pounds. Wow. Just incredible. Yeah. So, you know, it, 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 you have to work on it, not only the medication, but it'll change your lifestyle as well. And I, I call this a negative catch 22. When people start losing weight, they feel better. They start exercising more. They they buy a new set of clothes. They For get sure. Married. It's like a jump start. You know? It, yeah. It's a new start on yeah, life. Yeah. It's probably the most effective uh, treatment we have for obesity. Agree. Okay. And then the side effects we talked about. Um, well, we talked about they, they still protect against heart attacks and strokes because just because it's a higher dose, it means it doesn't protect anymore. Um, I think this is important to say briefly. We have lectures on our website. There's a... Uh, a class of medications we call fixed ratio combination. It's a typical basal insulin, either Lantus or um, Degladec or Traceba, mixed together with a GLP-1 receptor agonist. So the one with Lantus is called uh, uh, Adlixin, which is one that they don't typically market in the US separately. And the one with Traceba is Victoza. And you start off uh, with a low dose, you titrate it very slowly based on the morning blood sugar, kind of like you would do just basal insulin alone. And uh, it's amazing that people's A1C comes down, they, they lose weight, um, and it's very easy. It is easy. I mean, who wouldn't want to take two injections? I mean, you know, get two injections out of just one injection. It's a combination medication. And then the other really important thing about these medicines is that by, and we won't go into the details here, there's other lectures on the website, but by combining them into one injection, we actually decrease the risk of side effects with both, yep. um, which is a really cool thing, I think. Yeah, you titrate like two units at a time, one unit at a time, and then you, you do not experience the nausea that, that you would might expect with a GLP-1 alone at those set titration step points. But you know what, they, they designed this drug to make it easy for people. And everyone was saying, well, it's good for primary care doctors to prescribe, but you know what? I prescribe it a mm -hmm. lot. Uh, I like easy too. For sure. And, it is, and it's amazing how well uh, a little bit of GLP-1 mixed with basal insulin works. You'd be surprised. So keep that on your list of potentials. Um, okay. Are you guys ready? Let's, where's the drum roll, Eric? Uh, we want a drum roll here. 
I mean, this has got to be the most exciting thing that's come our way in the last few years for type 2 diabetes. So there was a medication called terzepatide, or it's also pronounced Monjaro, um, which it was literally just recently approved by the FDA. Like two weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so exciting. We've been hearing about it for a long time so in the doctor world, so we're really excited that it's here. So this is the first type of a new class of medication that combines those GLP-1 medications that we we're talking about with another medication called a GIP. Um, now you're probably getting sick of all these letters that were thrown out there, but we'll tell you a little bit more about it. So it's a once weekly medication and it works very similar to the GLP-1s. So if you look at the next slide, we have kind of uh, showing you the different effects that Steve just went over with the GLP-1s, you know, that it tells your brain that you're full sooner. It helps your glucose get go into the fat tissue like it's supposed to. Um, it helps you, you know, your, your pancreas secrete more insulin and shut off glucagon, which is helpful. And then, you know, GIP basically does almost everything that GLP-1 does. Um, it doesn't delay the gastric emptying as the GLP-1 does, but again, very, very similar. But the idea is you don't kind of have to know all these little details. It's basically like getting kind of two for one and getting double the effects of each one. Um, so what they're seeing in the studies with this new medication is that the A1C reductions are around 2% to 2.6% from the baseline. You, this is huge. Yeah, you guys need to know that when we see a reduction of 1% or 1.5%, it's tremendous. And this, in some of their studies, they're called the SURPASS studies. We, we summarized a lot of the studies on this slide up to 2.5% drop in your A1C. Just imagine that. It's huge. And, and what we know from studies with all medications is that sometimes when people start out with higher A1Cs, the drop's even farther. Yeah. And um, so that's kind of what we think of as the low end of the drop, right? So, yeah. And the studies are a little bit different because it's really important, like you just said, to know what the baseline A1C is. In these studies, it was about 8.5. And that's why I use that in this yeah. example. Yeah. Um, other things that they've seen in those surpass studies that you were talking about is up to 94% of patients, that's almost everybody, had an A1C less than 7% at the end of the study, which is really almost unheard of. I can't think of another study where I've seen that before. Um, and up to 62% of patients had an A1C less than 5.7. Whoa. Yeah. That is, that is, I, I mean. Uh, less than 5.7 is normal. Right, right. And we've never seen any data on any diabetes drug reported at the percent of people less than 5.7 because the numbers were so small. So the other thing that's important about that 5.7 is, you know, back in the day when we used to see A1Cs less than 5.7, to me that I started to get worried about low blood sugars. But this medication does not cause low blood sugar. So we're thinking about getting A1Cs that low without any lows attached to it, which is a big deal. Um, and then significantly, you know, the other thing that they saw with, with this medication, which is not surprising, is just massive reductions in body weight, up to 22%. So that's like saying, if you weigh 250 pounds, going on this medication, you could get down under 200 pounds to yeah, 194. That, that's on average. Yeah. Some people lost more. And, you know, these, these drugs have a natural lipostat that, you know, they don't cause people to get anorexia. You know, the heavier you are, the probably the more weight you lose. It's, it's impressive. It is uh, really impressive. Yeah. Keep your eyes open for that. Well, we decided that, how are you going to remember this name? Think of Mount Kilimanjaro. So it's the last part of Kilimanjaro. Now, the other one is, if you're Italian, you can say Mangiano. So anyway, <laughs> you, you, you got to think of ways to remember these crazy names. Okay. We should do these quickly. Okay, so just quickly, we do wanna mention for those of you with type two who are on hundreds of units of insulin per day or really, really high doses of insulin, um, which is not uncommon if you have type two. So don't worry about it. But the cool thing about these newer basal insulins is that they're concentrated. So we have two types of concentrated basals to JO, um, which is concentrated Lantus, essentially, and Traceba, which is a newer um, insulin all in of itself. But these pens hold a ton of insulin. So for those of the, you that used to be on kind of the regular concentration pens, you would kind of go through pens very quickly throughout the week. Yeah. And now we have a pen that holds up to, you know, 900 units, 600 units, and you can even dose higher units at a time. Yeah, the insulin itself is concentrated, so you don't get a big glob of 
liquid insulin in your thigh or wherever you inject it. No, you got to be careful not to take a syringe and suck it out of the uh, pen because your, your insulin syringes aren't meant for those units. But it really is meant to waste less insulin, waste less pens, and, and make it convenient for people. For sure. Okay. We also have newer rapid acting insulins or mealtime insulin if you think of them. So for those of you that are interested, we have Fiasp and Lumgev. These are two faster acting um, Humalog and Novolog. And essentially, you know, there are lectures on our websites about this if you're interested, but you know, just be aware of them. And if you're interested, go on our website and watch some more lectures about how these work. Absolutely. Um, Another fast-acting insulin is, is inhaled insulin. Do you want to talk about that, Steve? Yeah, just a little bit. This is a picture of the inhaled insulin device. We don't want to spend too much time on this, but there are extensive lectures on our website by Dr. Pettis. Uh, Dr. Pettis and I both have type 1. We use a Frezza. And the key issue is that it gets in your system quickly and it gets out quickly. Better post-meal blood sugars and less delayed hypoglycemia. And for a lot of people with type 2, what they like about it is it's easy and they don't have to take an injection at a restaurant or, and it also works better. So this medication is approved for type one and type two diabetes, and it may be helpful for you. Okay. You know, we also want to give you some idea of kind of what's coming. Obviously there's a lot of cool stuff here right now, but many people don't know that in the works is once weekly basal insulin. That is mind blowing to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, usually patients that are on basal insulin, they have to take it once a day. But now um, there are some really good studies showing that I think this is gonna work and, and be approved in the, in the near future. Yeah, and even combining it with one of the GLP-1 drugs, kind of like the fixed ratio combinations, which are daily injections. Mm -hmm. So everything's meant to be effective, safe, uh, and, and easy to, to implement for yourself. Yeah. So speaking of making your life easier. Um... If you guys are living in a cave and you're using one of these glucagon <laughs> kits, any type two on insulin, even a sulfonylurea like glipizide, gliburide, should think about having an emergency glucagon kit. Yeah. And this is the old one. We're not going to go into detail about it, but it was really a pain to use. You see the picture. You got to mix in the diluting fluid, suck it out while the, your, your loved one's doing the fried egg having yeah, a seizure. Right. Uh, so now we have um, much, much easier options for newer glucagon. You know, we have auto injectors that are kind of like an EpiPen, essentially, just very easy to use. We have a nasal spray glucagon, um, also very easy to use. So for those of you who are on insulin, please ask your, you know, healthcare provider about one of these. Yeah, especially those on insulin, for sure. And then the other point we just want to make while we're talking about low blood sugars is when you're treating a low blood sugar, you want to make sure that you're eating pure sugar to treat that. If you're awake and you don't need to take glucagon, you're just going to eat or drink something, right? So you want to drink pure juice or soda, regular soda, candy corn, you know, as a picture here, Starburst, Skittles, a lot of people like. Avoid like Snickers and yeah. chocolate bars because that's slower. Do you know how many... Um, uh, kettle corn do you need to treat a low? <laughs> Eight bags. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a joke. I have no clue. But when you start, you cannot stop. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, let's end our session with talking about probably one of the most significant advances in terms of technology for type 2s. Because continuous glucose monitoring, those type 1s, those son of a bitches, they've been hogging them all for years. And people are finally realizing that, hey, they can be really be helpful to people type 2. Now, Trisha and I believe they can be helpful to anybody with type 2, no matter what you're treated with. Currently, a lot of times you won't get, you won't get it paid for unless you're on three shots a day. But let me just go over briefly the major ones, which is, you know, we have the Freestyle Libre, where you see the sensor on the arm and you swipe a monitor over it. On the upper right, we have the Dexcom G6. And then in the middle bottom, we have called the Eversense, where you have a little sensor implanted under your skin, and it stays there for six months now. Amazing. So um, it's it's a personal choice. Um, and we on the website, we have so much about CGM. But remember, if you're a type 2, this could really be helpful. Not only behavior modification, but to see how your medication is working. Also, it'll help you uh, decide what to eat, how much to eat. You'll see the benefits of exercise. We've seen people just 
turn around like you can't believe just by putting on the device and them seeing their numbers. Yeah. The way I think about it as a doctor is I think about it like a medication. I mean, essentially, when I put a patient on a continuous glucose monitor, it's like improving their A1C without having to give them another medicine. It works that well because people just automatically kind of can see what's happening and adjust their behavior. Yeah. We're going to end this talk with some of the advancements in these devices. So um, why don't we just go through this, Tricia? Yeah. Just quickly to review, um, the way that continuous glucose monitors work is there's a little sensor. It's like a little tiny wire. It, It looks like a piece of hair. I mean, just tiny inserted under the skin. There's a little transmitter that sits on top of it that transmits the data to whatever the receiver is that you have. And that can be a smartphone in some cases, a smart watch, a little you know device that they give you. Yeah. Um, there's many options. And again, I just want to stress, we have so many lectures that focus just on CGM on the website if you're interested. Um, but the big deal about this is it not only gives you the data about the glucose, it can help you change your decision about what you're going to do. Like, gosh, maybe I'll go for a walk around the block, or maybe I'll change my medication dosing, or maybe I will eat half of that piece of cake next time. Um, And then it also not only gives you the glucose number, it tells you where it's going, which I think is really cool, especially for people on insulin. It can kind of tell you that your blood sugar is heading down quickly. Um, and or going up. Or quickly. going up quickly. Yeah. And it has alerts and alarms on there too, which can, you know, really is a safety issue. Yeah. And remember, alerts and alarms are your friends. There's a whole thing about alarm fatigue, but we're not going to get into that now. Now, one of the things that's a little bit of a shift in the way we're thinking in diabetes is we're really getting away from the hemoglobin A1C as kind of our target and moving towards what we call time in range. That's what TIR stands for on this slide. And time in range means how much of the day are you spending with a blood sugar between 70 and 180? And the goal is about 70% of your day. And that's about 17 and a half hours in the ideal range. Um, and then the other area that's important is the time below range. We don't like hypo, that we want the, the percent of time between 55 and 70 less than 4%. Yeah. And then below 55, less than 1%. And if you're uh, older and have lots of other health issues, you got to really get your hypos down to almost zero. And the time and range, we don't worry about that much. We, we just want you to be over 50. So this is a, a typical download. Everyone should get the app and go over these numbers with their doctor. You see, this is a patient whose average gl- glucose is 151. Goal is less than 155. St- standard deviation means how much you're bouncing around. We want that minimal, at least less than 50. Then there's a thing called GMI. It's the estimated A1C. This person's not doing too shabby at all. And there's their percent time and range. And as Trisha mentioned, it should be over 70%. So everybody needs to be familiar with these, this terminology. It's the same as the terminology that doctors use. There's the 55 to 70, should be less than 4%. Below 55, less than 1%. Um, this is a 24-hour uh, profile. The midnight is to the left. And you know, in two seconds as a provider and two seconds as a person living with diabetes, when you see your own numbers, you could say that's the biggest problem part of the day. I don't know what you're doing at night, <laughs> but I don't even want to ask. But that's the area that we can focus in on during our clinical visit. And if you're looking at these numbers yourself, you can say, hmm, yeah, that nighttime snacking isn't yeah. good. You know, so um, and this is one last clinical example of a patient with type 2 Um on basal insulin, you know, Lantus, Levomir, and we got the download um, and the A1C was just a little high and we realized right away that the biggest and only major problem during the day is bounces up too high after dinner. Mm -hmm. So you can try everything you want. You can try, you know, reducing your carbs, exercise after eating, and we ended up adding one shot of fast-acting insulin right at dinner time. And I wish I had the post one to show you, but it's awesome. All right. So we'll end with kind of where CGM is going. You know, it's constantly evolving. So these are the three systems that that we use frequently and kind of what's happening in the future. The Freestyle Libre, the one that, you know, Steve talked about swiping on the arm, the newest Freestyle Libre that will be coming out is the Freestyle Libre 3. It's smaller. It's about the size of a penny-ish. Um, and the cost, nice thing- cost more. 
<laughs> costs more than a penny. The nice thing is you don't have to swipe it anymore. It's just going to constantly give you readings like the Dexcom and the Eversense do, which is going to be really nice, I think. Um, the Eversense 3 that we, E3 that we've talked about, it's a quick office procedure where they, they put the little sensor underneath the arm. Six months. Can you imagine not having to put on a new sensor for six months? Not, and then Not dealing with refills. Yes, yes, that's a big one. Um, and then the Dexcom G7, we also expect to come out soon, which is going to be much, much smaller than the prior Dexcom. It has a shorter warm-up time. And then I think one of the biggest things is you don't have to um, save the transmitter. For those of you who know about the Dexcom, it's going to be combined. And you can kind of just rip it off and throw it in the trash. Like the Libre. Yeah. It's combined in there. So um, we talk quickly. So that way, when you look at this later, you can put it on slow motion <laughs> <laughs> and stop it. And see this picture? about the future of diabetes. You know where I got this picture? Where? Google image. <laughs> that was it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Tricia.